the learning to this uh, platform to address us on a very important subject. And I will try in a little while to say what, why it is important to me as well as to Al Furqan Foundation. As you all know, in the background of the rise of Islam, some very important events took place that had very far reaching results. One of these is a strong uh, international relations debate, so it's not new in the Middle East. International tension over and in the Middle East and around the Middle East is not new at all. Then the two giants of the day, the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Empire were locked in a prolonged and protracted warfare in which a number of consequences happened. One of them, the change in trade routes from the Persian Gulf, or what is now known as the Persian Gulf, to the Red Sea Basin. All the trade routes shifted between east and west from the region of uh, the Mesopotamia between the two rivers and the Gulf on to the east or down to the south also to Africa. Now it's all concentrated in and around the Red Sea Basin. This meant that the caravan cities along uh, the Arabian coast, the Western uh, Arabian coast became very important. Trade routes implied need for labor for manual uh, support and caravan routes needed camels and needed drivers and hence a rapid urbanization process from the desert into the main cities of these were two very important ones Mecca and Medina Mecca was not only a center for pilgrimage it was also a center for trade and for transactions on very large scale between north and south and gradually the region to the north of Mecca and Medina, namely to the Syrian desert and to the Fertile Crescent became very important because the decision was made not to take sides in the war, but to play a role of positive neutralism. Again here, positive neutrality is not a new uh, policy in the Middle East. It was not, uh, you know, brought about only by Nasser and Nehru and uh, Tito, but long before in the Middle East there was this uh, attitude of positive neutrality between the two belligerent parties, uh, deal with both and commit yourself to none. And hence the region north to Mecca and Medina became very important, that is what is known as the Shamiya Desert, north of Najd which is the area that uh, I suppose uh, Dr. Gelani is going to limit herself to, where this area became a very important area to branch the trade coming from south to north, and some of it goes to, to the southern part of the Mesopotamia and onto the Persian Empire and some of it went straight north via cities like Petra and then Palmyra and other such caravan cities onto the Byzantine Empire. So the neutrality of that region and the role of the tribesmen in it became very important in the background of the rise of Islam. And we have ample evidence that they were very uh, important poets and very important literary movements in these areas. Some of the Mu'allaqat came from that region. So uh, we'll see now the one aspect that was neglected and still is neglected in Islamic history and that is archaeology. And uh, Dr. Gelani is primarily an archaeologist. She is also a, an anthropologist. She took her BA in both anthropology and archaeology in 
from Cambridge University and later from Edinburgh University she got her MA and her doctorate in, in Babylonian art and Babylonian script in particular the cylinder uh, literature on the cylinder did that to us at the University of London and she worked in Iraq regime for eight years participated in a number of excavations and <coughs> here we are going to rely on someone who participated in excavations and had first hand information on how to gather uh, data from the ruins and the sure. remnants of civilization which we have neglected in, in Islamic studies very little excavations were done except in some of the uh, Umayyad and uh, later uh, Abbasid uh, sites in and around the Syrian desert and in particular in what, where Jordan is today, Transjordan and Syria for the early caliphate and uh, therefore without much uh, further comments I would like to turn the floor to Dr. Gilani. Uh, may I first uh, th uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Ibish, and I would like to thank the uh, Furqan Foundation for inviting me to speak on such an obscure and forgotten subject for the Arabs. Um, but it is relevant to this uh, to this organization here because it's de dedicated to the preservation of historical documents and it is appropriate to be interested in the survival of information from pre-Islamic period. However, can I have the, oh, can I have the slide thing? Um. It's not on. No. Um, I'd like to start, the first uh, uh, thing is to give a panoramic view of the international situation of the Fertile Crescent around the 9th century BC. Um, probably from now on I will not mention BC all the time, but when I'm talking, it means I'm talking everything will be before Christ. <coughs> the first thing I will talk about is who were the people that inhabited this area. Around the... On the west of the Fertile Crescent, around Damascus, and north, and all this area. They were the Arameans. The Arameans arrived, let's say, in, uh, in the Syrian, from the Syrian desert, from the Syrian Arabian desert, just before 1000 BC. They were quite a lar large tribes, and they sort of swept uh, quite a lot of the area, um, uh, disturbed the political situation in, the, in those places and formed their own little city-states. Being many tribes, they tended as, uh, uh, as independent uh, uh, little city-states which they never united. And as a result of that, they've never been able to form a, a real power or an empire in that area. Um, they centered around Damascus as one kingdom. There will be one in Aleppo and one in Hama, and there were other smaller city-states. South of Damascus and uh, the Syrian, there were 
the Judean, Judea and Israel, but by that time uh, they were weak and small uh, kingdoms. They Again, they were divided and were in complete rivalry of each other. Um, and on the, of course, Phoenicia was on the coast, and again, they were all cities. So we have a situation in the west of the Fertile Crescent, which was quite weak, had no central power. As a result of that, the larger uh, uh, power, the Assyrians, who were all usually uh, tried to subdue these uh, city-states and tribes, had a, ve a, a very um, difficult time with them because these uh, tribes, be uh, being of their independent character, tend to um, submit to the Assyrians while the Assyrians are there and then break their oath the minute the Assyrian army goes back to its uh, base in, in Iraq. Um, they used to have coalitions. The minute the, they had a, an outside power, they would unite together against the foreign power. But there was always one of them who would break away and change allegiance from one side to another. And this went on for centuries. To the south of that is Egypt. Egypt by sort of the beginning of the first millennium, that is 1900 BC, was a weak country. In fact, it was so weak that the Libyan tribes from the west were able to infiltrate into the delta and form uh, what we call the Libyan dynasties, which is dynasty 22, dynasty uh, 23. Uh, in, the, in Upper Egypt, uh, Egypt in the south, it was the Sudanese, the Kush, Kushite tribes who infl infiltrated to Thebes and formed later the uh, Dynasty 25. So there was a complete <coughs> vacuum uh, on the west of the Fertile Crescent. There was no superpower there, um, and we have to look for which superpower then rose to control the ancient Near East, and that was Assyria. Assyria in the north of Iraq, in that area. The Assyrians, again, probably originated from the Syrian Arabian desert, who emigrated to Iraq quite in the second millennium BC. But again in the ninth century, they started to form a rather important and powerful kingdom. <coughs> and for having such a, uh, a powerful uh, country, they needed quite a lot of re raw material, which Iraq at the time did not have, or <laughs> still we don't have it. We don't have metal, we don't have wood, and having a very complex society, quite affluent, they also needed quite a number of luxury goods, like gold, like ivory, which, which used to decorate their palaces, they needed stone, and for that they needed the, uh, to, to control the trade routes and to control the source of this raw material, which meant that they had to conquer these lands, or at least subdue them, or at least influence them. And as a result, there was a complete, uh, an expansion of Assyria, west, east, north, and even south. Babylon was completely uh, weak at that time and in fact under Assyrian rule. Um, our um, information, uh, you know, what we know about this area really comes from Assyrian records. The Assyrians were 
very important to us today. In fact, what they left us is their records. And we thank them for it because they were the only ones who wrote everything they've done. Achievements, war, their life, their literature. The Arameans hardly recorded any of their hands. So our, all our information about the area really came from a Syrian record. Unfortunately, these records are rather uh, biased towards in favor of the Assyrians. But we can't, it, they were as propaganda. Most of these records were uh, carved on the walls of their palace, of the king's palaces, as a propaganda to their subjects and to the foreign visitor to remind him that they were the real masters. Um, Assyrian kings played a very important role in this, in giving us all this in information. They were avid uh, builders. They built palaces and they adorned these palaces with their reliefs, if it is art or if it is inscribed. And they built each king nearly built a new capital. Their first capital was Ashur, which this is a detailed picture of the uh, center of this uh, uh, map. Uh, their first uh, uh, capital was Ashur, Ashur, and they took the name from the, the name of the capital and their god was also called Ashur, and Ashur stayed as the main religious center of this uh, empire. Then one king uh, the, in the ninth century called Ashur Nasser Pal II, he moved the capital from Ashur and went and had a political uh, capital at Nimrud. Nimrud called in ancient times as Kaleh. That stayed the capital of Assyria for about a hundred years. This was moved by another king called Sargon II into another, another, uh, uh, another town whom he called after himself, and he called it to Shaokin. Uh, uh, this capital did not last very long after his death. His son moved to the another capital, and that was Nineveh. And Nineveh, I think, most of us know about it. It is modern Muslim and, uh, and became the capital of the world, one of the wonders at, at that, that time. In these palaces, we had all reliefs which today we find in the uh, many museums, particularly the British Museum. I hope I'm doing it. This is how most of the, pa uh, uh, the uh, reliefs of the kings show uh, uh, and, and the writing. You could see the writing here, cuneiform inscription. This is the characteristic type of inscribed do um, documents in, the in ancient Iraq and in fact most of the ancient Near East, where the king would have had all his achievements recorded. We see the king here standing on both sides of what is we call the sacred tree. The god Ashur is in the middle, standing inside a winged disc. This is his symbol. And we have two protective jinnis on either side of the king. Um, we had quite a number of these uh, 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 reliefs in the palaces of the Assyrian kings. I'm just giving an example. One of the, another thing about these uh, documents, which is very important to us, is that the Assyrians, and so the, most of the Mesopotamians and the, ancient, and the people of the ancient Near East, they wrote in material that is not perishable. They wrote on stone or on clay. 
and that's why we have such a lot of information about these, uh, about historical and even social life. Um, this is one type of uh, a rec uh, record, recorded document. The second type was on clay. And these are royal records. Whenever we see uh, a sort of, uh, uh, we call them prisms, but, uh, you know, um, barrel-shaped documents, it must be a royal uh, document. It usually gives year by year the achievements of the kings. And, and usually, the, it usually, in fact, most of them are made of uh, uh, made of clay. The capital where we, uh, I, I think I'll go back to, I can't go back. So we, to we talked about Assyria, we talked about the West, and there is the middle, and the middle who was there at this time it was the Arabs. The Arabs had a very important position because the Assyrians wanted the material, the raw material from the west or from the north, and they wanted quite a lot of, uh, of goods from, I can't keep it, yeah. Uh, And the trade routes would go, would have to go. It would be very long for them to go right through to avoid the desert. They couldn't go through the desert. They needed somebody to do that for them. And here the Arabs come into, pos into importance. They had camels, and with the camels, they were able to, uh, to travel for long p uh, s distances, and at the same time, the Arabs. Uh, at this had, uh, were in control of these trade routes. So there was a kind of two dependence. The Assyrians depended on the Arabs to bring them the goods. The, As the Arabs needed the Assyrians to, to sell their goods. But at the same time, there was also the Assyrians wanted to subdue the Arabs. And this conflict went on for centuries. And I will show later on how many of these, it was Arab wars right through. One of the important things about, uh, about it is that they were in control not only of the goods from the west, they were also in control of the goods coming from the south, which is incense and many of the uh, precious stones that came from an incense and spices. Spices, the Arabs were very famous for bringing them. In fact, one of the kings uh, uh, says that he uh, was able to get 50 sacks of spices from the Arabs in one of his wars as a booty. It was such an important thing for them. Most of our source, historical sources, come from the city of Nimrud, the capital that was the capital of Assyria during the 8th uh, part of the 7th century uh, uh, BC. Um, it was built by Ashur Nasirpal, and then another king later on, uh, it, first his son, Shalmaneser I, who had the first contact with the Arabs. And the first, I, uh, I think I'd better say something about Nimrud before I'll go and talk about them. Uh, this is an imaginary uh, photograph of what the Assyrians had, the luxury and the greatness of, uh, this is Nimrud as the capital as imagined by a Victorian painter last, uh, in the last century. Uh, the palaces, how they looked like. Most of the, uh, unfortunately, most of the reliefs, like I showed the one before, 
uh, were painted at the time. Um, this is nearly correct of what it should look like. And these are the ivories that the uh, Assyrians really uh, prized. Thousands and thousands of them were found in the palaces, uh, uh, imported, let's say imported, but mostly came as presents and tribute and booty from Phoenicia, northern Syria, and the ivories mostly, of course, coming originally from Africa. Uh, they decorated the palaces. Most of, of their furniture was decorated in ivory. And the ivory itself was covered with gold. So they needed the gold, they needed the ivory at the same time. Uh, that's another one. This is a typical Phoenician uh, mm. ivory piece on the top. And even the one at the, uh, the bottom, uh, these would have been uh, attached to furniture again. I've got another piece, and this is the back of a bed, which is a complete piece of ivory. Um, and this is the gold. These are gold discovered in, uh, in Nimrud about 10 years ago. Uh, in the royal, uh, the queen's royal tombs. There were three tombs who were discovered in 1988, 89, and 90, and uh, quite a lot of the gold, like this plate in the middle, in the middle, is, uh, is, is a Phoenician work. And uh, we even think that one of the queen could have been an Aramaic uh, queen, uh, wife of one of the Assyrian kings. Uh, the Assyrians, when they used to uh, subdue these tribes, quite a lot of the royal family would have been uh, brought back as captive to the royal court and sometimes married uh, 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 married to, into the royal, uh, into the royal uh, kings, the Assyrian kings. Um, this is perhaps one of the most important uh, document for the Arabs. It's the first time that the word Arab has ever been mentioned. Um, it belongs to King Shalmaneser III, who is the son of Ashur Nasr Pal, who this, we, we count him he, the, the king who established the Assyrian, the Neo-Assyrian Empire. In it, he gives us the story of one campaign he had in his sixth year. He went into Syria, crossed the Euphrates and went to, into Syria and was faced in a cam uh, a, with a coalition of Aramaic kings and so on, of twelve, he says, twelve kings. Um, this included um, the king of Damascus called Adad, Neri, uh, Adad Idri, the king of Arpad, which is the, uh, its capital in Aleppo, so the king of Aleppo, the king of Hama, the king of Israel, Ahab, which is we know about him from the Bible, and he mentions also King Jundub, king of the Arabs. So the, na the first Arab name ever mentioned in history was called Jundub, and for the Iraqis we know Jundub means Jarad, so I, mean, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what you think of that. Uh, he, he faced them with a battle just north of Aleppo at a site called Karkar, and he boasts about this battle and he says that he killed about 20,000 soldiers, took another 20,000 carriages from them, and Jundub the Arab contributed to this battle with 10,000 camels. That shows 
the min you know, from the first time that the Arabs are mentioned in history, they were rich. They were quite strong to be able to give such a lot, in, uh, to share in such a coalition. And probably also um, uh, they went to this coalition for fear from the uh, Assyrians uh, that they will stop them from con uh, going on with their trade. However, um, uh, uh, Shalmaneser claims that he won the battle. He kept on talking about this battle right through his life. For he, he, he reigned for 32 years. And whenever he wrote about his achievements, the Battle of Karkar is put there. But from the, the historical records, we can deduce a different uh, 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 story. He probably had a very bad time at that battle. He must have had a bloody nose because what happened is that when he returned to, to Nimrud, he didn't go back again to the West for six years. And that was very unusual because he tended to go every single year on a campaign to stop the Aramaic tribes from revolting again. Um, which is again a very interesting thing for a Middle Eastern ruler who always claimed victory when probably victory wasn't there. But he kept it all the time. In his, on his throne base he wrote it. On his uh, statue he wrote about this battle. So we have another um, very famous stele which he erected in the temple at Namrud, showing his commemorating again this battle and other battles with it, but the mention of the Battle of Qarqar was on it. He also, I'll show the detail. He also show here, and uh, again as a, uh, is the king of Israel, who was called Yehu, and that is also interesting because it's the first time, like the Arabs, the first time ever the Hebrews are mentioned in history. They were mentioned together with the Arabs living in the same area. So there was no claim, maybe there is no claim for being that they were earlier than the Arabs in the area. Must have been the mother of battles. The mother of battles, yeah, absolutely. He kept on about it. He kept on about it. And you know perfectly well he didn't really win it. Okay, maybe they he won it, but in a very bad way. <laughs> um the next king which we know about that had any um contact with the Arabs was called Tiglat Pileser, Tiglat Pileser in the Arabic, in Arabic, Tiglat Pileser the uh, third, and he is also he was such a strong king and very powerful that his, his name survived in the Bible as Paul, and it is Paul, P U L, uh, and I think there is that thing that and the uh, and the Assyrians came down, like you know. In, uh, yeah, in the wolf fly, uh, the, 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 it is really that. That is for for Tiglat Pileser. He was such a strong and powerful king, and he had many wars with the Arabs. He had a terrible time trying to control them. Um, we see him. Um, uh, fighting them on the western side. And one of the first people that he um, encounters was this time an Arab queen and not uh, 
and uh, and Amman, and this is again very interesting on the, uh, on the uh, with the Arabs is that we have many queens, not one, not the odd woman. Uh, the odd woman. If you look at the um, the uh, table that I have given you. I've put Q next to every name that is a queen, and you could see how many of them. And this is again interesting. They, they may have been um, at the same time not only queens, they were probably chieftains, in, uh, but they may have been also priestesses. And with being priestesses, they exercised quite a lot of power and influence on the tribes. And, and so, on both sides, they were uh, quite powerful. And this one, that uh, the queen that we know from Tijat Pais Lizer, called Samsi or Shamsi, who was the daughter of the first ever Arab woman mentioned, Zabiba. She, uh, Samsi, lived for a long time. With uh, with with Tiglat Pileser, he had a he had a, a very hard time with her. She really was very powerful, and and her uh, and the wars that he had with her was commemorated on uh, um, reliefs on the pal on his palace. Here, unfortunately, the real uh, relief was uh, lost, but there is a drawing of it. And it shows, we think, it's Shamsi herself, on the camel, fleeing, of course, because she's turning and putting her hand up, trying to protect her people, let's say. We see some of the Arabs uh, falling down, victims. And what is interesting, we'll see it again and again, to distinguish an Arab from an Assyrian or from any other uh, people, we see them always in a short kilt, short, um, semi-long hair, not very long hair, and pointed beards. These uh, these are from the palace of uh, Tiglat Pileser in Nimrud. That's that's another one. It's after the defeat of Samsi, and she was taken to Nineveh. And here, she, it is probably her again, walking towards, there should be the king sitting, is, uh, sitting on his throne, and she's bringing the booty with her. And the first thing, it's the, cam the camels. And the camels, I can't resist showing a picture of a modern camel caravan. They, it, honestly, if you look at them, it's exactly the same, the, the movement of the camel is exactly the same. Behind her, we see captives, prisoners of war. Another type of booty. The Assyrians took prisoners of war into slavery and into cheap labor. They needed them. Um, here we have a palace attendant being uh, without a beard, which indicates that he was a eunuch. Uh, introducing the, pris uh, the prisoners of war to the king. After him? Send them to Cuba? Cuba? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another uh, Assyrian official introducing more of the booty that they got out of the Arabs, and here it's cattle. And uh, we'll ha we, we, ha we usually have long list of how many, and they are all usually in the thousand, two thousand, twenty thousand, and so on of these. Uh, it, 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 it's, that's it. They took everything for la better life, for better life, or for the affluent life in Assyria. And the last comes the sheep. These were all from Tijrat Pileser uh, the, uh, the third. At his time, 
he mentioned not only, of course, Samsi, there were other tribes. There were a number of, uh, and the, for the first time also, there is a mention of a very famous Arab tribe that lasted for over several hundred years, more, uh, yeah, from the Assyrian period right to the end of the Achaemenid period, and it's called the Qidar. And the Qidar continue to come into conflict with the Assyrians. And this is, um, we, uh, I, it, and he, he mentions, for instance, how many, Tiglath uh, Leather, how many he was able to get as booty from the Arabs, uh, 30,000 camels, 20,000 sheep, and 5,000 sacks of spices. That's from one battle. He, we, uh, he, he also says, that as a punishment, he burnt their tents. To, to Samsi herself, he brought her back, as we saw, as a, uh, as a uh, prisoner. But then he took her back and made her queen again. And this is another policy from the Assyrians with the Arabs. It was sort of, sometimes they humiliated them, and sometimes gave them partly part of independence. So he, he took Samsi back because she was so important, she was so powerful, the Arabs followed her. So he wouldn't deprive them of her. At the same time what he did, he put, uh, he appointed an overseer with her. That was also a kind of humiliation. You're not going to be on your own. I'm going to have somebody with you so you don't misbehave again. But she had to pay him tribute, and the tribute was nearly every year. He, she, he, they, they used to impose certain type of uh, tribute for, uh, with, uh, to the, uh, uh, on the Arabs for every year to be paid. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, policies of the, uh, of the Assyrians of how to control the Arabs they controlled water resources. Being in the desert, they needed water for their cattle and uh, camels and so on. And that was their only way. And the ca uh, most of the uh, water resources will be nearer to the urban areas. So the Assyrians were able to control that, uh, that, uh, these places. So there was this thing the whole time is a, as a, as sort of cat and mouse uh, 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 game between them. Who is going to control what? We come to the next king, who is Sargon II. Sargon II, at the beginning, was quite nice to the Arabs. He wanted to have a peaceful uh, time with them. But at the same time, he's started doing a number of policies, which was uh, the relevant policy of the superpowers at the time, of resettlement. So they'll take, if there is a tribe here who was troublemaker, they'll take it to another side. And he moved one from, uh, from the sort of Jordanian border of today and moved it to the Egyptian side to stop the Egyptians from trying to make any influence into the Palestine, Palestine area. <clears throat> and we see another, another type being moved to Samaria, which was the capital of Israel. They moved a whole, he moved a whole Arab tribe and resettled it there. And that was for another reason, not only to to subdue the tribe because they took, he, they took them out of their homeland. It's also because he was trying to redirect the trade routes, to, to weaken the Arabs by taking the trade routes up into the um, uh, coastal region and then up to the Euphrates and so on and avoiding the desert. Um, and, and he was the first to try 
to have contact with Egypt also. Sennacherib, his son, uh, his grandson, in fact, um, tried to ha uh, had quite a number of uh, wars with the Arabs. Uh, by that time, the population of the Arabs has increased. And not only increased, but they became, they started to settle, exactly like before them, the Arameans, before the Arameans, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Amorites, and so on. Always the desert people slowly, slowly start to um, settle in, uh, within the uh, urban areas. And by the time of Sennacherib, which is the end of the 8th century and the beginning of the 7th century, we have them in Babylon. In fact, uh, at Anna, which is on the Euphrates, um, we, uh, we have their names that they were even making trouble to all the uh, caravan routes. If a caravan passes, which is, doesn't pay them uh, taxes, they would attack it. And we have now settlement. Settlement with Arabic names. I don't know if, according to linguists, these were uh, Arabic names. Settlements or little villages and cities called, for instance, uh, Birdade, Dur Birdade, or Dur Abi Yata. Um, he also had a war right through the west, going down uh, uh, from uh, from Syria down to Palestine and subduing all the uh, countries uh, along the way. And we know one Judea with the uh, King Hazak uh, here uh, resisted, resisted, and Jerusalem was under siege for a long time. And here it's, an, uh, it's a very interesting uh, uh, historical incident because Hezekiah was not able to, uh, to defend Jerusalem except with he got the help of the Arabs. It didn't take long for uh, 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 Sennacherib to, uh, to uh, conquer uh, Jerusalem. But it it's, it's just shows you that the Arabs were there all the time. Um, this is from one of the palaces of an Assyrian king. I, I mean, I, I know some people don't like it to, sh to, I don't like me to show it, to show that how the victimization of the Arabs then. Because here we see some Arab woman, possibly the queen, we don't know, a queen, being led by an uh, Assyrian uh, uh, you know, soldier. There's another soldier or a captain or a, who is really trying to cut the head of possibly an Arab chieftain. And there's a, th a third Arab chieftain trying, pleading, presumably, saying not to do it. It's a painting from a palace uh, now in northern Syria. Um, and this is a detail of the of the same painting. What, uh, okay, it's probably not nice to show Arabs in such a situation, but at the same time, to have them being uh, portrayed means that they were really important. For instance, today we know of uh, Israel and Judea having such a lot to do with Israel. There is no representation. Apart from that King Yehu, okay, there is a lot of mention about the, the, the conflict between the, uh, uh, the kingdoms of Israel and uh, had, but the Assyrian kings did not see it important enough to portray them in their paintings or in their had, while the Arab campaigns were repeatedly by many kings to show what happened to them, which shows how important they were 
first in the propaganda war to show it to the other uh, nations that they were under, uh, look what we've done to them. So we'll do it to you at the same time. And secondly, how much headache the Arabs must have given the Assyrians. I, I, I just put this map, sorry it's in Arabic, I'm sorry about this, but I don't have an English one. It's just so the, uh, the overall picture, again, uh, uh, for the Arabs, where they, uh, they roamed or lived. Wadi Sarhan was the place where they mostly were inhabiting. One of the most important uh, 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 centers was Duma. She, it, uh, it was du oh, Duma, Duma Tijendal, I think mm -hmm. we call it now. And uh, it was the capital or the center, first as a religious center, and secondly, was the center for, uh, <coughs> for the, uh, uh, the, the Qidar tribe, the largest tribe ever in the Arab world in that time. And, uh, and the Qidar really, late, uh, from, now, uh, from then on, we, we see them not only in this area, but we see them in Babylon. We see them, they went right up to Damascus um, and up to the uh, Sinai Desert. And uh, I'm told that Shammar, the, uh, the, the tribe of Shammar, has its center again around this area today. So it looks like that, you know, that ancient tribe more or less has the same uh, region of Shammar today. Um, the other uh, uh, oasis town that uh, comes into the history of the Assyrian Empire was Teba. And they complained the, the, uh, on the Assyrian relief how far it was, how difficult to get to it. And uh, th there is one description in one of the Assyrian uh, documents talking about when they crossed the desert and what they saw. And of course, I, 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 it's all exaggeration because one week they saw nothing but uh, scorpions, the others was all uh, snakes and so on. <laughs> but it just shows how much they, uh, they uh, uh, faced trouble uh, trying to subdue them. Before I come to the to this period, before I come to this period and talk about the Arabs in Ashur Bani Pal's time, we have Esarhaddin. Esarhaddin also um, uh, had a long history of uh, uh, trying to subdue the Arabs. He, he what I uh, find about him is that he was rather greedy because the, uh, the king of the Qidar, who was called uh, Khaz'al, uh, gave tribute to his father. And when Asarhadun came to power, Khaz'al went to visit him as a peaceful uh, to keep the uh, Hadun. When he got to Nineveh, uh, Asarhadun told him, OK, we'll get along but give me some more tribute. So he raised the taxes on him. He also had other tribes to deal with. And one of them was a queen, and she was called Talhuna. I don't know what it means, but it looks Talhuna um, must have been married his father, and so he had, he had a very uh, troublesome uh, uh, um, relation with her. Her daughter could be, this is all rumors, could be the daughter of Sennacherib. And it looks like by the end, he sent this daughter Tabua to become a queen on the Arabs. This is again one of the policies 
that was carried o over by the uh, Syrians. They'll bring the, uh, the, the children of the chieftains, um, like even recently, like the British used to bring the uh, Indian Maharajas, educate them and take them back, so they become their vassals. And the, uh, this is exactly the same. The Assyrians did that. They would bring the uh, 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 the princesses or princes and so on, rear them in the palaces in in Assyria, and then send them back to become vassal kings for them. Uh, and he sent her back uh, to. Uh, he even sent Talhuna back to become a queen of one of the Arab tribes. And, but she revolted again, and she was sent back to it. So it's, it's the whole time. I mean, it's like, I don't know if we could say like today, there was always trouble. It's never been uh, a, 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 a sort of peaceful uh, relation for a long time. Uh, as it had at the same time, uh, try to invade Egypt. And here we see the importance of the Arabs again, because he couldn't cross this Sinai without their help. And he says in his documents that uh, he had to get the Arabs and rent from them their camels to cross the desert. And this is a policy that we see right through history. The Romans did it, even the Ottomans did it. The Ottomans did it in, in 1914 to cross Sinai. They went and rented 20,000 camels from the Arab tribes in the area. For, and each camel they, paint, they paid 10 gold liras. So you can <laughs> see how <laughs> it was going. Uh, uh, they needed them. Uh, they, uh, there was another war of Sirhadin uh, 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 with another tribe, and this time he talks about going to uh, the land of Basu, we don't know where it is, with a king called Leali. And uh, one of the punishment when he defeated Leali was, uh, Leali of course ran away, and so he took all their gods the statues of the gods of the Arab tribes, took them back to Nainala. And that Layali could not bear, and this is one of the things, they could not bear parting from their gods. So he gave in, went to Nainala, begged uh, uh, Asar Hadin to give him back his uh, statues. He gave them back on the condition that his name is written on the statues. On top of that, he asked him for more. So he raised the, pro uh, the taxes again. I mean, it's fantastic. Asar Hadin was really extremely greedy. He always upped the booty from all his, uh, uh, the other kingdoms that he ruled. And last we come, uh, to King Ashurbanipal, I think most of the Iraqis would know the name. He's one of the most important uh, Assyrian kings, not, uh, not only because he was such a uh, powerful king. Uh, Assyria at that time reached its zenith. It was possibly the most powerful country in the ancient world. It had the largest empire ever, and he was on top of that uh, a learned man. He not only conquered and killed, and he once skinned one of the Arab kings after the defeat, uh, he had a very famous library. He collected the literature of Mesopotamia 3,000 <coughs> years earlier and put them into one library, and uh, the library was discovered last century, and all the documents from that library is now in the British Museum. Uh, Ashur Banipal had many wars. Wars with the Arabs on the west, 
near Damascus in that area, and he talks about them. He uh, says that he uh, killed thousands of them. He also depicted them on his palaces in Nineveh. One of these most important uh, uh, reliefs now in the British Museum is this piece, which shows the Assyrian army fighting hand in hand, with, you know, against uh, the Arabs. The Arabs are on camels. I mean, they had no choice. Uh, I mean, no chance because you've got the Assyrian army with real weaponry on carriages. Um, but you can see them trying to fight the Assyrians, falling down. More, even the camels are falling down. And he talks about it, and he says that he burnt all their uh, uh, this is a detail of it. I, I, I think this is one of the most wonderful pieces of uh, uh, there, a defiant uh, fighting. Here he's falling, a victim. Um, many kings here, we f find their names. You've got Amuladi, one called, the other was called Yata, king of the Qidar. Then he, uh, they were defeated, and he turns again into Babylon. What happened in Babylon? There was a revolt. The, revo uh, the, uh, the governor of Babylon, or they called him king, was this, uh, the brother of Ashurbanipal. And what happened is that he was the rightful heir to the throne. But a palace or a court conspiracy led by the grandmother. It was the w a woman, uh, say, uh, let's say, conspiracy. The grandmother didn't like, like the younger grandchild and persuaded the father, Esar Hadin, to remove the heir to the throne, who was called uh, Shamashum Okin, from the uh, and make Ashurbanipal, the younger one, into the heir to the throne. And uh, uh, Shamashum Ukin was given Babylon as a, uh, to be a governor there. He never accepted it. And, really, and that civil war, which ended, uh, which meant that there was, uh, there was a revolt in Babylon. Yeah, there was a revolt, sorry, I <laughs> can't. Um, there was a revolt in Babylon and a civil war that took several years. And a direct uh, reason for the fall of Assyria later on. It weakened it. It weakened that. Uh, and who helped uh, Babylon in this revolt? So of course, everybody. Everyone under the rule of the Assyrians immediately takes side against them. And so we have uh, the Elamites in, in, uh, in Iran, southern Iran, taking, uh, uh, helping the Assyrian, uh, the Babylonian king, and also the Arabs. So we have tribes around the area who, who uh, helped Shemashum Ukin. And in fact, they went and entered Babylon. By that time, the Assyrian uh, Ashurbanipal was able to put siege around uh, the city, ended in a famine in the city itself. There was a complete, uh, and <laughs> by that time, the Arab tribes decided they don't want to stay, so they tried to get out and were captured by the uh, uh, Assyrian uh, king. At any rate, it ended up in by the murder of uh, uh, the Babylon uh, Shamashum in Babylon and the Arab uh, the, uh, the the uh, uh, the Babylon revolt was put and to an end. Uh, we have again an, um, another war. The, uh, also, we don't know which of these Arab campaigns these are portraying, but definitely 
it was in the desert, uh, just west of Babylon. And here we see that the tents, their tents being on fire. He, he mentions that he put on them on fire. A rather unpleasant picture here. It's the woman being raped here, being stabbed there. So there was no mercy to anybody. And uh, 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 he, he, uh, Ashur Banipal wasn't pleasant with them. Let's put it like that. And he even caught one of them, was able to, ca to catch one of them called, the, I mean, one of the kings who was called Ayam. And he executed him and proudly said, skinned him before he killed him. Uh, and the other king, he took uh, Abiyata, he sent him uh, to Nineveh, then forgave him and sent him back to become king again. That's another of these details showing uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, tent with the victims, uh, uh, Arab uh, soldiers, die, dead Arab soldiers. To end it uh, is to show one very important relief from the palace in Nainawa, of Ashur Banisa, uh, uh, Banipal's palace in Nainawa, and then to show how important these uh, the, uh, Arab events for the Assyrian kings were. Um, if you see, there is the king, and he is receiving the dignitaries with the soldiers here, the dignitaries, which are kings, paying tribute, paying, uh, uh, you know, swearing the oath of loyalty to the king after submission. Uh, that's a better, a better picture of the king on his triumphant on his uh, uh, carriage, and with the inscription giving detail of his triumph. And in front of him are these four kings. The first one was the king of the Elamites from southern uh, uh, Iran. This one, he had a long uh, war with him. Uh, and then three behind him, and we think they are the Arab, uh, 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 the Arab kings. Uh, Abiyata, one of them, the first one. Ayyam, the second one. And Netno, Net, Netin, 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 and he is the uh, king of the Nebayut, not, not the Ambat of the uh, of later on, but in the same area, and they were called Nebayut. And it's interesting here is that by the end Nebayut first was quite friendly with Ashur Panika. Then he changed his mind and had a war with him. And by the end, he had to come and give, uh, give, you know, his submission to the king. What is interesting is that this is one of the main reliefs in the palace of Nainawa, and that relief shows the Arab kings. To, to end this triumphant, uh, um, uh, reliefs or ceremonies Ashur Banipal is relaxing with his wife uh, uh, in his garden and a little detail to show that the uh, what happened to the Elamite king that's his head uh, hanging with all the singers and the musicians around enjoying themselves. I'm sorry to, say, to end my lecture. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Thank you very much. I'm sure we all agree
that Dr. Girani gave us very important hints of what the situation is in the was in the Middle East. Namely, and first and foremost, that the Ara Arabian tribesmen were atavistically resistant to any form of centralized control. And that's one of the weaknesses of the it's dynasties, the yes. The Abbasid, the Umayyads, suffered greatly from the resistance of the Bedouin tribesmen to centralized control. Any form of it was resisted and rebelled against. She gave us also a hint of, uh, if you're not with us, you're against us. And the mother of battles, how sometimes you, you repeat it on and on to convince yourself that it was a really a great battle and you won it. And uh, no doubt that uh, tribesmen exacted uh, transit trade, fees on transit trade, trade going through, they took uh, some kind of uh, what we call today Jews, Jimrok or customs and yeah. And uh, also a good insight into what the Greek historian said, never pursue a Bedouin into the desert because they live on uh, locusts, they eat locusts, they eat the jarbu or the desert uh, rat and they also eat the uh, iguana, the desert iguana, dub, and uh, they can endure thirst and you cannot. And they describe also areas where you find flying snakes, which are actually uh, snakes that, uh, vipers that uh, attack, you know, by jumping on and throwing their vermin onto uh, animals and people. And uh, anyone who goes to the desert nowadays realizes that you would be out of your mind to pursue a Bedouin into the desert. You'll get lost, you get dehydrated, and you're exposed to unspeakable uh, situations. <coughs> now, there is also a very important thing that uh, Dr. Girani mentioned that Arabs had very important women in their society, which perhaps is one reason why women in Islam, in at least Sharia, there is a reason to believe that there is a matriarchal background. A woman never loses her name in marriage, for example. She retains her maiden name. And women in Islam had always, in pre-Islamic times, uh, right to property that no one could interfere with inheritance and running her own property. A very good example was the prophet was married to a woman merchant that owned her caravans and her goods and he was employed by her. Later he married her, indicating that the women in that society played a very important role, not to mention that there were many queens among them. Many rulers, women rulers. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Girani, for a very interesting and informative talk. Questions, not lectures. No. <laughs> What's the origin of the word Arab? We don't know. I mean, exactly. They called themselves. We don't know what they called themselves because we have no writing. Uh, they didn't write themselves. But the Assyrians called them Arabs. Could it be that uh, letters are expected in B and B? Between the Armenian and the Arab people. Could it be that from Arab, from, from the Arab, who used to be as a guide in the desert, could we basically, there weren't uh, separate races, because my belief is that all these races came from the same origin, which is the southern Arabia. No. 
they were no the southern arabia no i this is this is actually <laughs> We, there is no evidence for that. But how can there be the desert? There's no civilization in the desert. It's not. It, it's from the south. No, but uh, there was no civilization in the south. So. Yeah, but you said they lived in the desert. How they lived in the they desert, lived? yeah. Uh, but they were, they there is always, there was always Bedouins in the desert, mm -hmm. like today. Mm. They, uh, you know. What were the origin of the. Uh, you mentioned Babylon, yeah. Phoenician. Yeah. I believe these were words given uh, by the Greek. What were they called at the time? Canaanite. Uh, Canaanite. Canaanite. Yeah. And Babylon. Babylonian. Was Babylon. It, Babylon or uh, uh, it depends. So uh, no, no, no. It depends from period to period. Mm -hmm. They would have been called according to, to the people then. Mm -hmm. Like today, we are Arabs living in Babylonia, okay? Before that, there were Chaldeans, let's say. Before the Chaldeans, there were Amorites. Before the Amorites, there were Akkadians. Before the Akkadians, there were Sumerians. It's the people... No, 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 no. No, they called them Sumer. They called themselves Sumer. They so called themselves, when they came and lived there, like the Assyrians. They called, they came, and we find them calling themselves Assyrians. You see? So it's, it's not I call them that. Assyrians, of course, I'm speaking in English, I'm putting it Assyrians. Ashurim. Whatever it is. The, 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 the changing the, the, the letters, mm. wa and, and e, mm. and ali and ayin. Mm. Ashuria, especially the first town, Ashur, mm. it, it, you change it to Arabic, it mm. sounds like Assyria. No, 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 no. And a lot of historians believe that a lot of these were from Southern Arabia No, uh, there is no evidence for that. This is, uh, I mean, theories, Any yes, but. Contrary? The, 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 yeah, because we know they are in the bad year. You see? Even they are Syrian? Yeah. Uh, all. all <laughs> well, there is no place one place for any of these things. The, I mean, the Arabs themselves don't come from one place, okay? So none of them came from one place. But they lived, before they moved to the sedentary, the, the urban center, they lived in the Badia Jazeera. So in most of them is that area. The south of Arabia huh, is a different world. We do not talk about it at this time. And we can't prove it philologically. Philo no, the, we cannot talk about it. Yeah. Philologically, especially, we can fall into great errors. Yes. Like, you know, many, many centuries hence, uh, if uh, Philadelphia in America is excavated, then someone will say this was Jordan, because Philadelphia is Amman. No, no. Again, it's that's Kamar Salibi's. Yeah, no evidence. Until I find an evidence, I, I yeah, will but not accept You cannot it. prove this philologically. Like, yeah. You it's have to do excavations. I mean, Jerusalem was Jerusalem right from the beginning. Hmm? Hmm. Is there any evidence of the change of the heat? Not really. No, not really. Not, uh, not that much, no. The heat is the heat. They, in fact, one of the Assyrian campaigns was in the summer, and they talk about it. And it was in May, June. Uh, and he, they... Mm. Not, not all that different, no. Mm. I would look at the, because they, they, they the usual thing. Why do we fight now? It's the usual thing. You want to control it. You don't want them to have it all. They want to have it all. <laughs> People seeking the same. Usually quarrel over it. 
Yeah. <laughs> because we have no actual writing from the Arabs. But their names is Arabic, so they must have talked, I mean, spoke Arabic. Of course, the, one of the earliest, what they call, let's say, not proper Arabic, but the first sort of, um, we call Northern Arabic, which our Arabic is derived from it and so on, is in Syria around fourth century. One of the first, so, but before that, they wrote in Aramaic. Aramaic was the language that, no, not that, no, no, not to really. We, or we don't know. Let's say that there's. <laughs> Please. 